I heard you went to uh, Morocco yeah. to do a thing there. I explain what, what no. happened. Well, we did uh, we did a track um, with this North African piece, and we had this tribe of musicians called Jajuka that, for many many years ago, um, uh, Brian Jones recorded, mm -hmm. and we put out this record uh, on Rolling Stones label. And they wrote to us and said, you know, we'd like to do some more things. The, the guy died, there was the head of the tribe, and his son had taken over and he was younger and he lived a bit in New York and he wanted to get involved. So we said, that's a great idea for this piece. You know, so we went to Morocco and recorded them. You recorded the entire song in Morocco? No, no, we recorded the song and then we, we recorded them playing along with it. They played strange pipes. And they have a mystical ceremony every year for this which relives the ceremony of the Pipes of Pan, which is a very old tradition. And we knew they would, that these pipes would work very, very well over this track, so we did that. I'm Bashir Attar, and I'm son of the Mr. Musician of Jejuka. I am take my father's place, and this is the home of my father's music. I am learning this music when I am about four years old. Mm. This is the other El Minzi car, sweetie. Yeah. Okay. Come here. Yeah. Are we pack? driving? Am I driving? No, yeah. Can you pack the boots? Yes. Okay. All right. And I'll see you down in the old men's room better yeah. now. Okay, put it in the other car. Put it in the other car. Put the other car. Okay. <laughs> Throughout this century, the liberal and exotic atmosphere of Tangier has been a lure for Westerners seeking inspiration, adventure, and in some cases, refuge. Jack Kerouac made the journey in 1957, and a few years later, William Burroughs made several of these extraordinary home movies. Burroughs also wrote his most famous novel, The Naked Lunch, largely in Tangier. Gregory Corso and Allen Ginsberg joined the 50s Beat Party, but the uncrowned king of the expatriate artists was Paul Bowles, the American novelist and composer who had been living in Tangier since the 30s. Bowles was one of the first Westerners to go up into the hills and hear the extraordinary music of Jajuka. Before starting the recording session, Mick Jagger paid a visit. Is it a long time since you've heard the, these Jajuka people? It's a no, long time. No, except on tapes. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't been down there since... It was in the 50s. Brian, I went down with Brian, Geisen. Geisen, yeah. And, well, oh, Hamry. Yeah. Do you know Hamry? Uh, well, I, I met him once. I, I, th I think he's persona non grata in Jujuka Is he? What did well, he do? Yeah. Well, we went to London and picked up all the royalties for the album. <laughs> it was supposed to be divided. <laughs> Democratically in the village. Because, did you go when Brian Jones went there? Hmm? When Brian Jones went there? He wasn't there when, when I was there, no. Oh, he, no, I was there before that. Yeah, and that's the 50s, and he went there in like 67 or something. Quite much later, yes. Something like that, and then maybe it was earlier than that, but he put, we put out the, the, the album, but he changed the sounds a lot of it. I mean, he did all kinds of strange things with it, processed it. It comes in and out. That's it, it's all phases. Mm. But that that record's um, quite well known now in sort of a cult way. Oh, yeah. I mm. think it was quite quickly after it was issued. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Jajuka is about 50 miles south of Tangier, in the foothills of the Rift Mountains. The musicians have traditionally been supported by the local people, and they have effectively acted as court musicians, playing at weddings and celebrations. There are festivals where they play for 10 hours at a time. Once a year, they reenact the rites of Pan in the festival of Brujolu, which embodies a mixture of fertility rites. The dancer dressed in animal skins represents Pan, who's held to have given the villagers the gift of music in return for a local woman. On finding out he had been tricked into accepting the village idiot, he cures her madness. Ever since, the village and the music of Jajuka have been renowned as a cure for mental illness. This sand is special for crazy people. Many people come here and we, 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 we guard them like this, you know? And, and when they stay here about one month or somebody is more sick, he can stay here about, about two months or three months few people they stay here. And, and, and this is the true. When they stay here, they go and finish with, with the problems they have or for crazy people. The people come from Europe, from England, directly to the sand. And the people come from America to here, to, to visit, because they listen about uh, sand, Sidi Hamad Sheikh, what he mean. Because he's his big Sufi who come to present the, the, the Islam in first here in this uh, village. And he give the name for this village, Zahwan Ja'aka, something coming good for you, the name of Jeju coming, something good come to you. The Jujuka, they did have this sort of odd historical connection which was kind of appealing somehow. Jujuka. Very tenuous, admittedly, but it did have a sort of. And there was this coincidental thing where um, when I was writing this song that we're going to do the, this drumming on and playing pipes and so on tomorrow. I said, oh, this would be great if we could have someone like Jujuka on it. And like the week after, I got a letter from them saying, could we come and play on a show we did? So it was very coincidental, that part of it. But we sent them the tape, right? We sent the tape to Bashir. And, um, but it's in a very early state. There was no singing on it. There, there was no, uh, nothing really except just the drum. So we've got to rehearse it tomorrow morning. So I don't know how quickly they can learn or whatever. Might take a while, what do you think? 
Well, they've been practicing, haven't they? I think so. That's what I'm told. I believe it. We live in hope. <laughs> but you're, um, you're quite pessimistic about most things. You're quite pessimistic about most things. About most things, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, it's, uh... is it still pretty much the same place? it is pretty much the same it's a little bigger on the outside the towns you know there's a few more farmers but right here in the center of the town it's exactly the same really maybe a few more donkeys back in those days yeah. and just to be able to hang around somewhere and listen to other people's music and uh, and it was so fascinating after just listening to your own for five years <laughs> yeah i mean and now it's all very fashionable this of world music. Yeah, well, I think that's got to do a lot with communications. Like, it, we get, people start to hear more and more about what's going on in other places, and uh, and there's more contact between people. And so, something that would have appeared really sort of exotic and strange maybe 20 years ago slowly starts. People start to accept other the music from other parts of the world. <laughs> This is Ali. Ali. Yeah. Mick Jagger, Alam Kabir. This is Abdullah. Abdullah. Hada Mick Jagger. This is Ali. Ali. Hada Mick Jagger. This is my brother Mustafa. My little brother. Your younger brother? Yeah. This is my little brother. This is your older brother. Yeah. You not you not so bad with him? No. Huh? You're strong with him? Yes, he play with me the music. We play same time together, man. This is Abdulvi. Hada Mick Jagger. This is Abdullah. Abdullah. This is Muhammad. Muhammad. This is old man. He want to see you. Busa she she busa. He want to kiss you. And they think he meet you a long time in Tangier. Time, in Tangier. Yeah. In 1001 night with Brian jo uh, Brian Geis and with Brian Geis and yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. This is his name Ali. Ali. Hello, Ali. Ada Mick Jagger. Hi. 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 Aji. Ada Muhammad. Muhammad. Mick Jagger. Malam Kabir. This is a Mukhtar. Mick Jagger. He said be very happy to meet you. Nice to meet you. This is uh, Ali. <laughs> this is Abslam. Abslam. Hi. This is uh, Lahsan. Lahsan. Ada Mick Jagger. Good. This is all of them this here, is good. And, and they are very, very, very happy. We're waiting for you 20 years 
a girl we waiting for you, Nick, and all of them be very, very happy. Well, I'm very happy that, that we could all come. Thank you very much. Hello, Ron. This is Abdullah. This is Keith Richard. Ron Wood. Yeah, it was so much fun. Joe, 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 it's, it's, yeah. it's fantastic. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Just an idea that Mick and I looked at one that, well, if ever we could use the Juca pipes, this is probably the track to do it on, you know. They pick it up amazingly quickly at first, it's just this cacophony of sound, but then suddenly you start, they're getting their patterns down, you know, it's not a lot of drums, you know, they all have to work out what they're going to play. But, uh, it's the pipes I want to hear next. <laughs> Yeah, that's really great if we can get that. Yeah. We're doing a section. Yeah. Let's get the pipe. This is a really good end then. Mm-hmm. Which we can put in yes. for the stops. Well, we, yeah, we, we have to have, have adequate bits for each section. Yeah. You know, to, to think that we need. So, so should we just go for this really fast section now? Yeah, I think, yes. From the speeding up. I mean, I don't know if... It, I will get that the speed now, but um, certainly when they get into that, when it goes for a yeah, long time. Yeah, when it's a long time on the speed, we can do that. And that is a really, that's the, yes. that's a really important thing. That's what do. I think we should go for next. Yeah, then give them a break. Yeah, then give them a break in the time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we can do a little bit separate drumming after as well. And then, and then pipes are for them. Yeah. Yeah. That's for the pub. Let's go for the speeding up. Let's go down a red line. <laughs> <laughs> It was the, it was the six, 67, 1967, and uh, we'd all been, my house had been raided by the, by the boys in blue, and uh, we thought, well, that's a good start to a year off. <laughs> so we said, well, yeah, let's get out of here. When Mick Jagger and Keith Richard came out of court, they were surrounded so, by... So uh, some friends of ours, Robert Fraser, Christopher Gibbs, were coming down, and Michael Cooper. We're coming down to Morocco, so uh, we said we'd join them down here. So I felt like driving, so I drove from London through, through France and Spain with Brian and Anita. And uh, Brian got ill, I remember, and so we carried on without him and left him in the hospital. And eventually, when we got here, he was already better and he was already 
in the hotel. So, uh, and after that, things get kind of hazy because we, we were so punch drunk from all that time on the road. But we were here for weeks uh, before we then drove onto Marrakesh. And we were just wandering around listening to music. Whilst they were in Marrakesh, the Rolling Stones met royal photographer Cecil Beaton, who had been visiting Morocco since the 30s. He photographed them and recorded the meeting in his diary. An evening with the Rolling Stones, Marrakesh, March 1967. On Tuesday evening, I came down to dinner very late. And to my surprise, sitting in the hotel lobby, discovered Mick Jagger and a sleepy-looking band of gypsies. It was a strange group. I don't want to give the impression that I was only interested in Mick, but it happened that we sat next to one another as he drank a vodka Collins and smoked with pointed finger held high. His skin is chicken breast white and of fine quality. He has an inborn elegance. He talks of native music. He'd heard a local tribe playing pipes like those used in Hungary and Scotland. He liked Indian music too. He said he'd like to go to Kashmir and Afghanistan. In fact, to get right away from England, which he considered had become a police state with harassment and interference. He maintained that he'd done nothing to deprave the youth of the country. If one is on one's own in, 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 in a private house, not doing any harm to anyone, I don't really see why all these people should wander in and say, you're doing something wrong. Well, he's not committing a crime against society, perhaps against himself, it may be true to say. The next day at 11 o'clock, Mick appeared at the swimming pool. I could not believe it was the same person walking towards us. The very strong sun reflected from the white ground made his face look a white, podgy, shapeless mess. Eyes very small, nose very pink and spreading, hair sandy dark. His figure, his hands and his arms were incredibly feminine. Their wardrobe is extensive, but everything is shoddy, poorly made, the seams burst. Keith himself had sewn his trousers, lavender and dull rose, with a band of badly stitched leather dividing the two colours. Brian, at the pool, appears in white pants with a huge black square applied onto the back. It's very smart in spite of the fact that the seams are giving way. But with such marvellously flat, tight, compact figures as they have, with no buttocks or stomachs, almost anything looks well on them. Was that the trip where Brian heard of the Jujuka musicians? I think so, eventually, yeah, yeah because we, we were a long time in Marrakesh. Um, we came back to Tangier, and, and that's, I think, when Brian got to hear about them. Because he came, when he got back to London, he was saying, oh, well, I'm going to go back and record these guys, you know. And so that was our first contact. At that time, he was... Uh, He's always the first one in the band to, to bring in other elements of other people's music. You know, he was in it, the sitar. He was he's very interested, and also he was very adept at. Uh, you could get Brian would walk in the studio, and no matter what instrument was lying around, he, even though he'd never played it before, he would he'd be able to knock something out of it very very quickly. You know, hence we used to use vibe vibraphones and stuff mainly just because they were lying around in the studio and everybody thought what a wonderful piece of orchestration but it was just sheer accident and brian's ability to be able to to get something out of an instrument uh, hence he'd pick up a uh, some sort of primitive sort of instrument say here and, and be able to play it you know so he, he did he, he brought more uh, Exotic tones to the to the band, shall we say? You know, would they? It, 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 I mean, you left the band, and we I mean, know what happened since. But do you think it, if if he'd stayed, would the would the music have taken a different course on the um, Would the band even stay together? Um, I wonder. I mean, uh, it's very difficult to say. Uh, <laughs> Brian, as a guy, was one of those guys who said, I'll never make 30, and actually proved it. You know, I mean, uh, so I, I really think he was burning out at the end. Uh, and then, so the question of he, if he was a different kind of person, then he wouldn't have been able to do what he did. I think there was a sen sense of urgency about Brian that, uh, that he had, you know, I think he had some fatalistic idea that he wasn't going to make it for too long and so he was trying to cram everything in at once, you know. After 
traveling to Jujuka in 1968, Brian Jones wrote, they're not singing to an audience of mortals, but rather an incantation to those on another plane. What sort of associations does this visit call up for you? Uh, well, I suppose it. No, I just went in the Bashir's bedroom. There's a big picture of Brian, and it sort of evokes that period a little bit. I mean, uh, for me, I mean, uh, it was something that Brian talked about and so on. And this this particular village, I've never been here before. And, uh, what did he tell you about the village after he first visited here? <laughs> I don't know how, what his... It, it, I don't remember him describing it in uh, very lucid terms. He just would play the, the tapes over and over and over. Now, it's really a music that's associated with madness and healing. So what was it that obsessed Brian about the music? Yeah, a pretty psychotic time, that. Probably had a lot to do with it. The, the fact that it, in that period, everyone was taking lots of acid and so on. I think that was a, for Brian, this was a kind of part of the acid experience. I'm guessing. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I think so. It certainly was a bit on, on the edge, all the experiences he was going through, I think. How much did his interest in this music influence the music that the Stones made? Because that was also the period of Paint It Black and We Love You. No, no, no. Well, I... Uh, the paint it black really uh, was before the, all this but also we love you and satanic majesties yeah. well there was an interest in sort of what was now called world music at that time and um so we were all very interested in that. i don't think brian had any kind of exclusivity on that interest in that it was an interest to everybody now, what sort of effect did the music have on you when you first heard it after Brian had brought those tapes back from his recording trip here? Uh, well, I thought 
but it was very strange because it was because it was done here rather than it was done in their own village in their own time and and so on and I think they got pretty crazy I and mean, we went on and on and on probably for days non-stop more or less I think that was the great the uh, the stamina of the musicians that you could see the other day they didn't really seem to tire them out to play these very long sections with all that breath and so on and it's quite tired banging a drum for sort of six or seven minutes and they just just went on and on so I think the stamina thing was great you know this, these people and they were smoking keef and they were playing this music for days and nights on end and got quite carried away I and mean, it's very hypnotic In some ways, coming up here brings everything round full circle. In a certain way, it's a sort of digression from hard rock, which is nice. And it's a, it's a, it's a nice experience for the band to have together to do something just to get out of a studio or out of a rehearsal room and experience a different kind of music to get together. Bring it around full circle. It's like it's a revisit, and I think that's good. That there's some. Um, historical continuity rather than if we went somewhere where we didn't know and taking it completely a, a chance or a shot or something that was just a sort of trend that we'd kind of latched onto where it feels there is there's a sort of a twinning between the, the two bands here a little bit you know Sunday, Sunday. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. You were there for a long time? Uh, I, I've been there about, uh, about nine months like this. Really? My first uh, trip to the United States. You like it? Uh, uh, it's very different. You know, it's, it's very different. <laughs> but New York is different. Mm -hmm. right. New York is very different from the rest of America. Yes. Yeah, yeah I know. I, I visit Boston too. Ah, yeah. Um,
I know, I always get I'll see you. No, doing it's my right. act. It's I'm doing right. my act. That's right, that's right. That's right, baby. That was the bridge part. Yeah. I just did some odds and ends, and Chuck did some bits. And... He was head security at the model's dance. He said, give my love a kick. I said, well, what, what? He said, well, I was... <laughs> Is he the one that said, you'll be back? Yeah, he said, I was <laughs> the, the Christmas guard tree. at the scrubs when they let him out. 